This is another short update on my 3D printed Polish Enigma machine. Uh, there's been rather a lack of progress for a, a few reasons, but I'll explain those as we get to them. Uh, you can see here though that I've, I've 3D printed the, the first version of my cover. Um, this isn't the final one because it's not exactly correct. So at the moment there are a few problems with it. One is that the the little windows here aren't lining up exactly right with the rotors and the lettering. Uh, that's just the positioning of things, that's quite easy to fix. The other problem, which you can't really see from this angle, is that this is not sitting flat. Uh, the way the cover works is it's in two pieces, apart from the little windows. If we take this off. You can see it's printed as a, a flat piece and then this back piece uh, which is screwed in place. Now what I've actually done is I've made this too tall and so you can see there are little tabs here and they fit into these slots in the um, in the plug board down here. So this sort of fits in like that and then the front of the cover just sits on the little tabs on the back of the lamp board. And um, this height has to be correct to get this to sit flat with the, the top of the lamp board. And unfortunately I got that wrong. And one of the other problems that I've discovered is because I was, I was creating all my models separately, um, it made it hard to see how all the different parts interact with each other. And I had to basically try to work that out with pen and paper, drawing little sketches and also measuring my physical machine. And what I realized was that I was going to have interference. So the tops of the, where the rotor mechanisms fit, this piece here and this piece here, actually come up a little bit too high and they interfere with the cover. So I had to, to 3D print in these little pockets. Um, I actually only printed one. I forgot the other one. So I, I just ground it out with a Dremel for this experimental one. And... Uh, that's actually made worse by the fact that on this cover, this piece is too high. So it's actually, if you imagine this is sitting level, this is much exaggerated, but it's actually sitting like that, um, just fractionally, but that provides extra clearance under there, of course. So when I print this the correct height, I get even more interference. And so what I'm going to have to do is, is reprint this cover, one, getting the little windows uh, for the letters in the correct place, and two, creating big enough cutouts on the bottom that, that the cover doesn't hit any of the mechanism. Now, like I say, what I've started doing is redrawing all my models and putting them into one big model so I can actually see how all these different components fit together um, in relation to each other. But it's getting there. This, this is basically what the machine is going to look like when it's finished. So that is effectively all of the parts there. Um, obviously there will be the box for it. Now I'm not going to 3D print that, I'm, I'm, I want to make that out of out of timber. Um, I just need to find the right timber. I've got some nice old recycled oak I would like to use but it's it's too, the, the timber's too thick so I need to to run it through a thicknesser or something but I, I don't have access to one of those so I need to figure out some way I can do that. But I do want to build a nice wooden case for it. I still obviously need to get the aluminium for the base um, as well, which is a problem. But oh, interesting! It was just happened to be in the right point to do the double double stepping then. But you can see this works. Um, I also still need to machine up all the the key shafts, and that's where uh, my little lathe will come in handy, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But that's basically. Where, where we're at. Um, not too much progress, but we're getting there. The, 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 you can see what the machine's going to look like now. It's, it's more or less complete. Uh, it just needs a little bit of finessing, uh, as well as all the keys and the wiring and everything else, of course. But at the moment, it's a nice physical model. Not necessarily electrically working, but it, it works mechanically. So this is one of the reasons why I think most people would find it difficult to actually use the plans I'm making to, to create their own um, Enigma machine. 
one of the difficulties is uh, being a, a precision machine some of the parts need to be quite accurate and it's quite hard to do that with 3d printing especially with a, a hobbyist type 3d printer so i've had to make use of things like metal shafts and um, brass tubing for axles and bits and pieces like that and i'm also going to have to machine up all the little metal contacts that are used in the rotors as well as standoffs and um, other little bits and pieces and really to be able to do that you need one of these and this is a, a lathe so this is just a what's called a mini lathe it's a uh, 7 by 12 inch i think which is very small but it's easily big enough for everything i need to to be able to do on the enigma machine now i've had this for quite a while and i've i've used it for all sorts of things and it's been slowly modified along the way but one of the the neatest little modifications i've just done to it is something I saw online, which is to get hold of one of these, which is a, a digital uh, tire depth gauge. So it's basically a little digital caliper, and it's used for measuring the tread on car tires. Um, what you do is you take one of these and you modify it. You, you cut off the bits you don't need. On the back here, I've glued three strong magnets. Um, they're just covered with tape to keep all the crap off them. And I 3D printed this little plunger piece, which also has a magnet embedded in the end. Now what this does is this sticks onto the lathe bed like that. And you can see as I, as I turn this, um, the slide here is moving backwards and forwards. And this is what I use when I'm machining things like, like this piece. This is actually one of the standoffs. Uh, this is the middle one from the lamp board. And to be able to machine these all to the accurate, the correct length, you can just read off the dial on the lathe, but that's a little bit tricky. And you've got things like backlash to contend with. Um, the backlash on this is quite bad at the moment. I really need to adjust that. But what I do is I roughly machine each of the parts, and then I measure them with my dial calipers and figure out exactly how much more I need to take off to get them to the exact right length. And that's where this little digital gauge comes in. So if you can imagine, this, this clips magnetically to the non-moving part, and then to connect to the moving part, I actually use these. Um, these are just magnets ripped out of hard drives. So that sticks onto the moving part like that. And now you can see as this moves, it moves the plunger. And if I can disconnect my camera without it getting too shaky. You can see here, if I zero this, whoops, this now gives me a digital readout of how far the, the lathe has traveled. Uh, at the moment it's, it's binding a bit. You have to get all of this lined up pretty well but once it's lined up it works very well and you can see the backlash you can see as I move the dial the numbers not changing that's the backlash in the mechanism um, of course anyone who fiddles with 3d printers will know all about backlash as well but that's just a little gadget that I use to to help be able to machine up the um, the pieces I need now, one of the reasons that the, the progress on my Enigma machine has been a bit slow is I've been distracted by other projects. There are other things I really should be doing. So, as I was saying, the, the lack of progress on the Enigma machine is because I've been using the time to do, to do other things. So, for example, that's the engine to go into this little car I've been building. And I've been getting back into my metalworking um, and trying to finish the car. So this is a little Austin 7 I've been working on. And what I've been doing recently was making the, the boot lid. Um, I still have to do the make a fuel tank and make a seat and various other bits and pieces, uh, as well as making the bonnet. But that's where a lot of my, my time's been going lately. So another one of the things that's held me up a little bit lately is I've needed to do a little bit of work on my 3D printer. 
Um, just recently I've been having trouble with some of the prints and I'm not exactly sure why. The, the printer did need a little bit of cleaning and tuning. Um, but I was also having problems with some of the filaments and things. So I've done a little bit of work on the printer just to, to tweak it and fix it up a bit. Now this is one of the problems with with 3D printers, especially one that you've, you've built yourself to your own design, is they're never finished. You're, you're always tinkering with them. You're always trying to make them better. And so I'm still playing with mine and I'm, I'm still playing with the best way to do prints and get things to print. Now these parts, this is a different project. This isn't the Enigma machine. This is something completely separate. But it was kind of showing some of the problems I was having with the printing, trying to print out a part like this in particular. Now, one of the issues I, I had was uh, warping. So trying to print a piece like this, it was actually pulling off the bed. And it's a bit hard to see on that one. But um, yeah, also this one, these, these are both lifted slightly. So if you put these down flat, they're not actually flat. And what happens is as this is printing, these little tabs were curling up. And after a while, what will happen is they, they as you print on the surface, the, the layers on top end up cooling down and they shrink. And as they shrink, they pull the bottom layers up and the print will curl. Eventually what will happen is the, the head of the printer will hit those bits because they're now sticking up and your print goes all wrong. Um, Sometimes the warping is quite subtle. I don't know if you can see it on that piece, but you can see the bottom edge there is slightly curved. Uh, you can probably see it on the front there. Um, I also obviously have a problem with stringing, but that's, that's fairly minor stringing. That's easy to remove. Uh, the other problem I was having was with the, the feeder, which is the thing that uh, pushes the filament through down to the extruder. Now my feeder was starting to slip. Uh, one problem was that it was full of shredded plastic, so it needed a good clean out. And um, what was happening was it was it was not extruding enough, and so the prints were ending up very weak with very thin walls. And you can see this one just just completely broke apart um, because it wasn't extruding enough plastic. Now um, I've made a few I made a few tweaks to the extruder. To fix that, uh, it, it had a small bearing in there that needed a couple of shims so that it, the bearing actually turned properly. And I've changed my oiling arrangement. We'll have a look at that in a second. Um, I did finally get that part to print. I, I printed it in black in the end. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for doing that, but one is because the red was getting right near the end of the, the filament reel. And I find that sometimes it's wound so tightly on there it's got a lot of curl in it, and I think that makes it harder for it to push the filament through the, the big long tube, and that was causing problems. So I did print it, and also I printed it with, with what's called a raft, which is when you print your part down flat, and you print effectively a layer, quite a thick layer, about 10 millimeters all the way around, and that just helps it adhere to the bed and stops it from, from curling on the edges. So this is, like I say, this is a completely different project. Um, didn't work that time, but let's see if we can make this go. So this is another one of the little little things that has been distracting me from working on the Enigma machine. Um, I'll probably come back to that one at another date, but we'll see if we can have a quick look at the the, the um, feeder and the changes I made there. This is looking around the back of my printer. Uh, there's not a lot of room here, it's a bit awkward to be honest. But you can see what we have here is the, the feeder, and this is what's pushing the, the filament, which is this here, coming off a spool just down here, um, through the, the, um, the, the tube all the way to the extruder at the end of the printer. Now, one of the problems I had was this, this thing's spring-loaded, and this is the drive wheel that's on the stepper motor shaft, and in here there's a little roller bearing. And uh, one of the problems was this block just has a, a slot milled in the end of it, and uh, when you put, this, put, put the screw through here, 
to hold the bearing in place. If you tighten the screw up too much, it would actually clamp the bearing and stop it from rotating. So what I had to do is put two 0.1mm uh, shims either side of the center of the bearing so that you could do that screw up tightly, but the, the bearing will still rotate. Um, the other thing I had to do is just clean this whole thing out because it had been slipping a bit and every time it slips it shreds the plastic and you end up with this full of plastic dust. Now, one problem I used to have with this printer a long time ago was occasionally the nozzle would clog and I found the way to fix that was to uh, lubricate the filament. Now, I'm using PLA filament, so a good lubricant for it is vegetable oil. And I found this little lubricating thing on Thingiverse and printed it out. It's basically a little tube with a piece of foam in it. And what you do is you poke the filament through that. So that would sit with the filament going through it. And you just put a few drops of vegetable oil on it every so often. And that lubricates the filament going through this tube. Now, the one of the problems with this, this worked very well. That, that completely fixed all of my... Um, nozzle clogging issues. But what I found was lubricating before the feeder also meant you lubricated all of this and that made it more likely that things were going to slip. So what I've done is I got rid of this and I've made here a little oiling device. So this is one of these quick release fittings and I machined up this little brass piece and inside here is a chamber with a piece of foam, just like my little plastic um, oiler. And this is a little tube with a little piece of glass there. Uh, this is actually a, a glass fuse I've repurposed. And what I do is, um, every so often, I just put a few drops of oil into that tube. And that, that flows down this little little copper pipe, and it just soaks the foam. You, you only need a couple of drops, and you don't need to do it very often. And that provides just enough lubrication on the filament but it's doing it after the feeder, so it's not making all of this slippery. And that just helps the filament feed back through this. Um, doing that fixed a lot of my issues I was just having with the, the um, extruder either missing or um, skipping. So what I've actually found is that the tension setting on this is very critical. So if you, if you have it too tight, um, and this binds up at all, it just shreds it and you end up with plastic everywhere and it just stops feeding, it just won't feed. Um, uh, that's actually if you have it too loose, sorry. Uh, if you have it too loose, it doesn't, it doesn't grip the filament, it shreds it. Uh, if you have this too tight, what I found happened is the stepper motor will skip, skip steps and you'll actually hear it as it's trying to feed it through as a kind of clunking. It, it sort of feeds a bit and then it, it clunks. And what that is, is it's the stepper motor saying, oh, I can't, I can't move anymore, and it, it misses steps, and it actually jumps backwards um, because it's not powered anymore. So it kind of, it's turning slowly that way and then does that sort of slowly and then jumps back. And it takes a little bit of fiddling with this setting, the tension on this, but once that's set up correctly, it, it works pretty well. Um, this is very handy. This is a little book reading light that... I use just when I'm changing filament and I have to feed it through. Uh, it's just battery operated. I keep thinking what I should do is actually wire in some little LEDs here permanently into the machine, but I just haven't got around to doing that yet. This is to show the the new 3D model I've been building um, for all the parts for this 3D printed Enigma machine. When I first started making it, uh, I wasn't quite sure how to use three, Fusion 360 properly, and so I created a whole bunch of different files for each of the parts. And what I've been doing is going through and simplifying a lot of my models and combining them all into one big model um, using, using components. And I believe this is a better way to do it, uh, to actually break things down into individual components and model them like that, but all in one model. So you can see here, I haven't quite finished yet. Um, I've got most of it there except for the keyboard and the bar that goes underneath here to make the rotors move and the poles that move the rotor. So uh, you can see with the 3D model, you can, you can rotate it around, you can look at it from any angle. Um, by using components, I can 
um, turn separate separate components on and off. So, for example, we can we can turn the rotors off if you don't want to see those, um, or you can turn the reflector off. So you can make these parts come and go, and you can see how they all fit together. Um, the other thing you can do is you can take measurements from here directly off here. So if I want to know how far apart these two things are, um, I can select them and it's a bit hard to see there, but it, it gives you the measurement. Um, so I can see exactly how parts fit together. So like I said, when I first did the cover, I had a problem where the cover isn't actually clearing all the different parts in the machine. So you can see here, this is one of the tabs on the back of the lamp board that it sits on. And these are the slots that the back of the cover fits into. Now what I can do to see where the interference is, is create things like planes. So I can construct this plane, which as you can see sits on this little tab. And if I highlight it, it shows me exactly which pieces are interfering with that plane. So you can see here, of course, the, um, the three thumb wheels have to protrude through the, the top. Um, this, this would just be showing you the, where the bottom of the cover is. And you can see the interference here with part of the mechanism. So now when I model the cover, I can model the cover based directly off this 3D model. And I can include cutouts and slots and things exactly where they need to be. Um, when we looked at the machine earlier, you could see that the lettering, uh, the rotors weren't, the windows above the rotors weren't quite exactly lined up with the rotors. With this model, I'll be able to see things like that and adjust my, my parts appropriately. So we can see here the, um, the interference. So we can turn that off again. Now, my actual workflow for these is I design the parts in Fusion. So for example, this is the, the plug board. And then I can find the parts and convert them into STLs. And I have this set up so that it automatically opens in Repetier Host for me, uh, which is where I do the slicing. So we can open that part. Give the computer a second to wake up. And there's my part there. And it's in here that I um, can position it. Uh, let's see. Always get these axes the wrong way around. And then slice it. Um, some of the parts have slightly different settings. I, I print most of my parts at 0.1 layer height, but I do vary things like the infill density depending on the part. And I also tend to print most of my parts with very thick walls, so uh, thick base, thick top, and thick sides, just to make them more rigid. But from here I would then uh, save that file, and I would go into the... Um, the Repetier host web-based server to upload it to the printer and I would print it from there. So that's more or less my workflow. So you can see with the model, um, I still need to get the aluminium plate for the base plate, but with my model that will allow me to come up with a, uh, a drilling plan because I can see exactly where all the parts fit on the base plate and exactly where all the holes need to be. And then what I can do is I can actually save this part as a DXF file, which is a two-dimensional drawing file. And then I can print that out and actually glue that printout onto the aluminium to give me an accurate drilling template. So I can then directly mark and drill the, the aluminium plate. Uh, it did take me a little while in Fusion 360 to figure out how you change the appearance of parts and what, what the material is. And so what you actually have to do is you, you bring up this appearance menu and you can see the different sorts of materials here that you add into this design. And then actually what you do, and I, I had to find a video to show me how to do this because there's no other way of, lo of knowing it, is you drag and drop the, um, the materials onto the parts. And uh, that's how you actually color them. And by doing that, I can separate out, out, separate out the different parts um, of the model, as you can see.